I saw something similar when they were trying to develop normal ranges for grip strength. Um, and what they saw over, you know, generations, you know, from, you know, like uh, Generation X, uh, Generation Y, millennials, like uh, coming through to what in America we call Gen Z, um, grip strength was declining, particularly in males. So there was a publication that said that and said, we need to change the normal range for grip strength rather than saying, we're getting weaker. Why aren't we working on that? And so, you know, it's it's like um, the the frog that sits in water from when it's cold, and then if you if you boil it, it will slowly heat up. It will never jump out because right? it never realizes because yeah. it's so incremental and slow. And so that's that's one of the problems is that we're looking. You know, some normal ranges are constructed around a population that's sick, so the normal isn't necessarily isn't necessarily normal, and that's that may be playing part of the role there too. Yeah, it, it it's super interesting. And hopefully, we'll get time to go into some blood tests that people can do. You mentioned seafood. Why do you think seafood is so important for our brain health? Mm -hmm. And then for people who are vegan or, you know, choosing not to have animal products, can they still have good brain health and get those nutrients that you would get from seafood in other ways? So there are a few strands um, that, that, that of information that lead me to think that, that seafood or I say seafood because it's the the most common dietary um, component that gives us long chain omega threes. What I'm really interested in is long chain omega threes, particularly DHA in the brain. And again, if I go back to what does it take to build a healthy brain in the first place, DHA is preferentially sucked up into the brain while you're making it, as much that the mother will sacrifice her own DHA status so that the baby gets enough, because it's one of the most critical fats that makes up the brain for a number of reasons um it and it goes it goes directly into the the cell membrane so people may or may not know that most of your brain which isn't water is fat almost all of it right so because fat makes up all the uh, insulation around the nerves it makes up all the the membranes around the cells and dha is incredibly important both for the function of the synapses how they talk to each other because of its because of the because of its structure it has this you know very important um role in terms of like how the synapses work, how neurons talk to each other. But then it's also accumulated into the mitochondria, which people might know as the powerhouse of the cell. It sits inside the cell, generates most of the energy. And some of it is really cool physics that basically how electrons travel through DHA is really interesting. Um, but equally, you know, sort of like a more basic way, you can see that the more DHA that's in a mitochondria, the greater energetic capacity it has, the more energy it can produce. Um, and that's the reason why, and, and there are some evolutionary theories that say that, you know, maybe the human brain as it currently exists, developed in a sec, in like a group of hominids that had either d direct access to a lots of seafood mm -hmm. or to the brains of other animals, uh, because brains are an incredibly rich source of DHA because your, your body preferentially shuttles it uh, to the brain during development. So it has this really important functional role. Um, and when you, um, don't have it that's associated with neurodevelopmental disorders or developmental delay, um, risk of other neuro, uh, like neurodevelopmental issues. Um, and then you can also see things like, um, there have been some interesting studies done in the UK and in the Seychelles where uh, you look at the, the amount of seafood that a mother or her, ba uh, her children eat and then you look at long-term neurodevelopment. And you, you asked about heavy metals earlier, particularly mercury is important for seafood. But it seems that even if you have a higher mercury burden because you eat a lot of seafood, you get a, you get greater benefit yeah. uh, because of the omega threes in the diet. Um, so that kind of you know that sort of first principles approach says well, what does a brain really want when it's developing and it really wants DHA. It's you know it's it, it's essentially that's where all your DHA goes is, is your brain and and again one of the things that um, is interesting about humans is that we're the only mammal that has fat babies. No other animal has fat babies. And one of the reasons why um, uh, human babies are fat is because they have adipose tissue as a store of DHA for the brain as it grows. When you say fat, you don't mean unhealthily fat. No, I mean, I mean like plump, healthy, chubby, of... plump little babies, right? So if you look at any other mammal, um, when they're born, they're very lean, even other primates. They don't have large adipose stores. And 
one, you know, it's it's an so it's an energetic store, right? We know that adipose tissue, fat tissue, is a is a store for energy, but what, but it also stores fats that are then particularly used to the brain, and DHA is one of them. So a developing brain needs it. Yes. Can we therefore say that a developed brain also needs it? So this is an exceptionally nuanced topic, even yeah. more so than any of the other topics that, that we've talked about. A colleague of mine, Dr. Rory Heath, and I wrote a paper recently about DHA and Alzheimer's disease. And some people have said that the DHA in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease uh, in their brain is low. Others haven't quite found the, the, the same thing. Uh, part of it is probably that, again, your adipose tissue is, is essentially a very nice buffer of DHA that you can use across your lifetime. So it's, it's, it's quite if somebody is, unless somebody has never eaten seafood or has never eaten really any long chain omega threes, it's very unlikely that you're going to be deficient um, in for, for the brain, for cardiovascular function, um, and, and other things that, that that may not necessarily be the case. Um, and that's why the omega three index, or you know how you know your omega threes in your blood, is a increasingly used um, risk predictor of cardiovascular disease and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it's so it's, it's very nuanced, um, but if you're going to be maintaining cell membranes and cell function, you're definitely going to need some. And then, the much better line of evidence comes from systemic measures of omega three. It's impossible for me to measure how much DHA is in your brain, right? But I can measure how much is in your blood, right? And when these studies were done at Oxford, they showed that you needed both adequate B vitamins and enough omega-3s in order for you to get this slowing in, in brain atrophy and cognitive decline. So if you measure omega-3 levels in people and they're low, they have a, a faster rate of cognitive decline, which tells me that that's important. Because yeah. if you fix it, then you can you can change that. Yeah, it's super nuanced, <laughs> um, but it's super important because, you know, tell me one of the things that I've noticed is I have seen patients thrive on radically different diets. Yeah. So I'm like, there is no one true human diet that's for everyone, in my view. It's yeah. just based upon 21 years now of clinical experience. It's like, I, 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 I've seen nothing to back that up. There are some principles, whole foods, uh, as much as you can, minimally processed, you know, decent amounts of healthy fats. There are some basic principles, but you can twist it in many different ways, culturally, ethically, you know, taste preference wise, using those principles to seemingly be in good health. I so I, I completely agree with with everything that that you've said. And I've also seen people thrive on an incredibly wide range of diets. Like I said earlier, I think that's one of the most fascinating things about humans. And we have to take individual health into consideration. And so Lots of things are done at the population level that are very important. But if two different individuals can thrive on very different diets and it supports their health in objective ways and they feel good, we have to be able to support them in, <laughs> and, and in doing that. Um, and to go back to omega-3s, like I don't, if you don't want to eat seafood, there are algal um, sources of long chain omega-3s, right? So you can do plant-based versions, absolutely. And you um, would recommend that to people? Um, I would recommend... so. I don't want to show up and just say people should take all these supplements. Ideally, you'd test, right? It's not difficult. I mean, an idea, you know, in in my perfect world, you would have access to this test of your doctor. It shouldn't be something you have to pay for uh, because it's much cheaper than you getting a whole bunch of cardiovascular and cognitive diseases because you just didn't know that what you needed was a bit more omega-3. So you would is, just, you would you would do one of those, what, blood spot tests? Yes, that you omega do a blood three spot test. for an omega-3 index. Um, and if you're in a good range, then don't worry about it. Um, if So that's, the, I think that's really empowering. It's like, look, if you're choosing to eat predominantly plants, you're choosing not to eat animal products, and you're maybe thinking about what Tommy just said and other guests have said in the past, thinking, okay, well, why don't I just go and measure my levels? Yeah. That seems like a pretty practical approach to take. Yeah. And there are there are some studies that have been done that have looked at the omega-3 levels, the DHA levels of um, omnivores versus vegans. And sometimes vegans have lower levels, but there have been studies that showed no difference, right? So you can eat a plant-based diet and maybe you don't have any issues whatsoever. One, one thing that's interesting is that there may, you know, I don't at this point believe in nutrigenomics where you can measure your, you can, you know, get a genetic test that will tell you the foods that you should eat. I don't think that we're at a point where we can do that. But one of the things that we know the most about is how our body metabolizes specific types of fats. Um, and there have been, there have been some studies that showed that 
if your ancestors became agriculturalists longer ago, right, so they were usually closer to the equator, usually became farmers um, further away in, the, in, your, in our ancestral history, like more thousands of years ago, then the body has adapted to being able to take shorter omega-3s like um, ALA, which you can find in nuts and seeds and some grains, and then turning it into these longer chain ones. Mm. By comparison, um, say half, you know, half of my family is from Iceland, right? You can't grow grains in Iceland. Um, there's not a starchy carbohydrate to be seen anywhere, right? They ate seafood and they still do. And, you know, that was where they got their omega-3. So their bodies never had to adapt to it. Yeah. So there may be some people, and one of the reasons why they thrive on a completely... Uh, plant-based diet is because they're really good at converting some of these precursors to the longer yeah. chain uh, omega-3s. And that's partly based on their ancestry and some other genetic components. So that's why I don't think that everybody who eats a plant-based diet should take an omega-3 supplement. I think they should test. And then if they need to change something, they should. But if they don't, then great. Yeah. Something potentially so simple has become so complicated because for years, we would have just had our nutrition dictated by geography, climate, by culture, what our parents and grandparents fed us. You know, what was really interesting to me, I went to Greece this summer and we were on this island called Ithaki, beautiful island. We'd, we'd been in Greece for about 10 days at this point and you know, we'd been enjoying chill out time, my wife, myself, the family, we'd been enjoying Greek foods. Um, but most of the vegetables we were getting served were aubergines and tomatoes, yeah. like literally every day. And we were at this restaurant in Atharki. And I remember, um, I think the kids fancy something different. And I said to the, I think she owned the restaurant she was serving us. I said, hey, um, you know, do you have any like other vegetables at all? Like, I don't know, broccoli or something else. And I've learned so much, Tommy, because she just looked at me baffled. And <laughs> she just said, no, they're not in season. Yeah. And I thought, isn't that interesting? It, it, she couldn't even fathom what, what you, you want to eat something that's not in season. Like it didn't compute. And it was really lovely, actually. It really made me think about how by having access to different foods three times a day and seven days a week, we can eat something different. We've, I don't know, it, it was, I don't know, any comments on that at all? I think more broadly, it's very possible that in the future, we'll figure out the perfect human diet. We can engineer it down to like, the micronutrient and the exact level that each individual needs. For each, you mean the personalized diet yeah, for each person? Like I'm sh at some point in the future, that may be yeah. possible. But right now it isn't. And so where I think we should get a lot of, a lot of our information around our diet are those things. Like what's seasonal, what was available to us, you know, in recent history. Um, and then... Yes, I think you should also take advantage of modern medicine and test the things that you should test. And there are objective measures that we can take uh, for our health from blood tests or, you know, if people are, or, you know, colonoscopies and all these, right? There are these things that we can take advantage of. If your diet is supporting your health and or there are, it's, you know, you, f you feel great and, and everything is going well, I see no reason to change it. Um, yeah. And like that, I think that's what's really critical. Yeah, why would anyone change their diet when they're thriving? Yeah. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here. <laughs>